Thank you very much. So, as Kavya said, hello, my name is David. Uh, I'm a software developer. I live in Sydney, Australia. Um, I'm also a bit of a fan of Go. Um, I've been privileged to be able to call Go my full-time job for the last six years. Um, I also help organise Go for Con every year. I've been involved in the local Sydney meetup, and I, I travel a bit uh, to talk and teach about Go. So, this is going to be a practical session. Uh, it's going to be lots of live coding and demos, so there's ample opportunity for things to go terribly, terribly wrong. So, if you can't see the screen, you might want to move forward, just to see my mistakes. And today we're going to talk uh, about the techniques for writing high-performance Go. Um, we're going to focus on three areas. Just start my timer. Three areas in this presentation. Benchmarking, performance measurement and profiling, and a little bit about memory management and the garbage collector. And really the goal is for you to take away tools and techniques that you can use to improve your own Go programs. All right, let's jump straight in. So before you can begin to tune your application, you need to establish a reliable baseline um, to measure the impacts of your changes. You need to know if you're making things better or worse. So in this section, we're going to focus on how to construct some useful benchmarks using the Go testing framework. Um, and we're going to give a few practical tips for kind of like traps for young players along the way. And benchmarking and profiling are closely related, so there will be a little bit of overlap. But we'll talk more about profiling in the following section. There are a few ground rules for benchmarking. Um, and they're mainly about getting a stable, repeatable ben um, baseline. First of all, the machine's got to be idle. This, this seems obvious, so that means profiling on shared hardware, maybe on like the staging or dev server, is probably not a good idea if other people are using it. Um, similarly, you know, like don't start a benchmark and then like watch YouTube in another browser, in a, in a browser tab or something like that. As much as the hardware manufacturers would like you to believe that um, cores are independent and isolated, the reality is less true for that. So um, really, if you're running your benchmark, don't touch your laptop. Um, more importantly is power saving and thermal scaling. This is, the, this is the other side of Intel's Turbo Boost and things like that. Um, while Turbo Boost basically takes advantage of thermal headroom in the processor and ramps up the clock speed, um, thermal scaling is the opposite. Once the processor gets too hot, not just the fan has got to come on, but the actual clock rate goes down. And you can see that in your benchmarks. Initially, the same code will start to run faster for a little bit until your laptop gets really hot, and then it will get, cold, it will get slower, probably below the original baseline. And avoid virtual machines and cloud hosting um, for, the same, for the, the same reasons. They're, they're usually too noisy to get consistent, repeatable results. Um, if you can afford it, um, at several companies, we've bought dedicated performance test hardware, we've stuck it in a rack, We've turned off as much of the power management as we can, and we've set the thermal scaling to uh, some kind of minimal baseline. And we never update the software on those machines. Now, this is terrible advice from a security point of view, but probably reasonable advice from a performance point of view. Because if you update the software, if you update the kernel, you're no longer comparing apples to apples. And fundamentally for everybody, uh, have a before and after sample, and that generally means running them multiple times. So, I should have asked at the beginning of this presentation, who here has, has used Go? Like, can I show of hands? Excellent, so keep them up if you've written a test. Good, keep them up if you've written a benchmark. Okay, a few, a few less than have written a test. Writing a benchmark and writing a test are very similar. Uh, in a test, you pass in a testing.t, uh, in a benchmark, you pass in a testing.b. And this little, uh, this little benchmark function, this loop, runs your function, in this case, fib of 20, b.n times. What's the value of b.n? Starts at 1, and if that benchmark function completes in less than a second, then the, the benchmark framework starts to ramp up the size of, size of b.n. Follows a roughly uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 5, 10 type progression. But, if, uh, but it, can, it can skip some. So as an example, let's have a look. How's that for size? Anyone see that? Make it a little bit bigger. 
So on this laptop, on this day, in this temperature, at this altitude, it takes, I, I, it's, it's not a joke. Um, my benchmarks run significantly faster. It's the coming into the summer in Australia. And when I do this presentation about six months ago, I get about 40, nanose 40 microseconds. Now in the summer, we're getting 55 nanoseconds. That's the difference of thermal scaling makes. Um, so for this example, we did 30,000 iterations and an average time of 54 microseconds. So a few, a few other kind of uh, tips about, about writing benchmarks. When you get down below, below the uh, microsecond mark, like when you're down in the nanoseconds, you're going to see some instability, mainly because of the relativistic effects of instruction reordering. Like literally what your processor was doing before it got to your code is going to affect the, um, the observed runtime of that code. And also things like uh, code alignment, like literally recompiling your program may change uh, the runtime. Only, you know, when we're talking in nanoseconds, so these are, you know, these are relatively small amounts of time. At the, other, at the other end, if you have a benchmark that instead of taking microseconds or milliseconds, you know, it takes, takes more than a second or something like that, you might want to run your benchmark for longer, say 10 seconds, just to get more samples so you have a more reliable average. Um, and as a takeaway, you shouldn't, if you need to do things like this, you shouldn't let them be tribal knowledge, like communicated, like communicated in Slack or like hidden in some wiki. You should codify them in a, in a make file or whatever tool of your choice so that you have like a make bench target and everybody uses, invokes the benchmarks in the same way. So as I said, for repeatable results, you should probably run your benchmark multiple times. Um, and it's very easy to do that with the count flag. Let's do that example now. So I'm just going to run it 10 times, pipe the result into a text file, which will become obvious in a second. Now you can see even now, the numbers are changing slightly. Um, in, uh, in a wider workshop where I, I talk about this more, you, I can afford, I have the time to run it longer, and you can actually see the thermal cycle as the processor heats up and then slows down. So now we have our before sample. We have 10 invocations of fib of 20. Let's improve fib and try to do a comparison. So at the moment, uh, we memoize the zeroth Fibonacci number, the first Fibonacci number, we could improve this code just simply by just memoizing the second Fibonacci number, which is, just someone yell it out. The second Fibonacci is two? No, it's one. Okay. If I had more time, there's actually a test. We can talk, we can talk about that, but so. I pick on Fibonacci because it's, a, it's an easy recursive algorithm. You can demonstrate significant, significant improvements. So here, just by memoizing the second, the second Fibonacci number, we've, in, we've improved the performance. How much? We'll find out in a little bit. So th this is the process you should be going through with all your benchmarking. Grab a nice solid before, before result and a nice solid after result. And then you can use uh, a tool like Russ, Russ Cox's BenchStat, which does some nice statistical analysis on it. Just, uh... okay. And that is a pretty good run. Um, so the, the before sample has a variance of about 1%, that's excellent. The after sample, variance of about 4%, that's tolerable. Um, and we can see we've, we've improved this, this runtime by about 37%. Um, it's got a really good confidence value, like P is virtually zero. And all the samples, both the before and after, that's the n equals 10 plus 10, were within that range. Uh, because generally uh, with you know, cold cases and things like that, one of, the, one of the very first runs of your benchmark will probably be well outside that range. And so it's not uncommon to see like comparing 9 to 10. So the, the benchmark framework takes care of just removing those completely irrelevant outliers. So that's the basic me mechanics of 
writing and analyzing a benchmark. There are a few other things that you might want to do when writing a benchmark. Uh, and one of them is you probably have a bunch of setup you need to do, like load some data off disk, compute some tables, a bunch of um, kind of setup which is necessary to execute the function under test, but you don't want that time to count against its actual runtime. So you can use this reset timer function, which basically just resets the clock back, and then we go straight into the loop. Similarly, if you have some expensive setup logic to do per loop iteration, um, which might be a sign that your benchmark, you're trying to benchmark something that is too large, like if it has too many moving parts, they all need to be reset you know, on every iteration, then you might need to think about refactoring your benchmark. But with that said, there's quite a few cases where we do this inside the standard library, so it's by no means um, extraordinary. And the easiest way is to, you can use stop timer, and then later on start timer to effectively pause the clock while you reset some, reset some data structures. Now, uh, there's been a lot of talk about garbage collection allocations, and it is absolutely true that allocation count and the size um, are strongly correlated with benchmark time. Like, allocation costs time, obviously. Uh, the easiest, so you want to kind of you don't want to know just how fast your function runs. You want to get an idea for how many allocations it's making because that may be a clue to how you can improve its performance. The testing framework gives us a mechanism to do this using b.reportallex, which basically records the number and average size of the allocations for the function. And so to look at that, uh, let's try an example. This is a kind of contrived, maybe you think of like logging some some kind of logging example. We have a request ID, the client address is a string, and the current time is a string. What it actually does is not really important for this example. And here are effectively four different ways of constructing this string. The first one, just use good old string concatenation. The second one, we make a bytes buffer, and we use the fprintf version in the form package to write into it, and then we turn that buffer back into a string. This third example, uh, we use sprintf, which um, externally you might think, well, it's kind of basically the same thing. sprintf is just doing what the example above is doing for you. And the last one is kind of like the, the, the loop unrolled version. We make a buffer we know is the right size because we can control the size of request ID. We know the time of, we know the size of formatted time. We know the client IP address is fixed to a certain size. So we can make a buffer of exactly the right size. Um, we append the bytes of the request ID, a space, the bytes of the client address string, another space, and we really kind of push the boat out with uh, the append format from the time package, which rather than returning time as a string, it will write it into this pre-prepared buffer that you give it. And then finally, we convert, convert that buffer back to a string. And what is somewhat off the end of the slide is a benchmark for this. Now, I would ask for a show of hands who thinks, it's going to, who thinks which is going to be faster, but in the interest of time, let's just find out. So this is our concatenate benchmark. Let me just make sure that it fits on the screen. fprintf, sprintf, and lastly, string conversion, which is the kind of unrolled version. And not surprisingly, the unrolled string conversion uh, is both the fastest uh, in terms of both the, the time and the allocations. You can see it only has five allocations. What's a little bit surprising is that um, the, con the dumb old string concatenation version, which if you come from Java and the world of string builders, you're told never, ever, ever do, um, turns out not only to be the second fastest, but has the second fewest allocations. So this kind of goes back to uh, one of my opening points, which is you know, maybe don't guess, measure. So that's an example of benchmarking allocations as well as just wall time. Now, this is one of my favorite examples. This uh, came from an issue which was raised eh, 18 months, two years ago, when we uh, bought the new compiler backend online, which is much a much better code generator. This is a population count function. Uh, for those who haven't uh, used such a thing, it basically returns the number of bits that are one in this 
UN64. So the population of one bits in this bit set. Uh, and, and the bug was that, well actually I won't tell you what the bug is, I'll show, we'll, we'll run the benchmark and you figure out what the bug is yourself. So it's just got a regular benchmark for n equals O, for each b dot n we're going to run pop count just of n. It doesn't really matter what the input is because we don't care what the output is. So let's run it. Just clear that screen. Okay, so it says that pop count function can run in 0.35 of a nanosecond. Um, this is a two point something gigahertz CPU. So that's kind of telling me that that instruction takes one clock. Um, now I know it's fast, but I don't, I don't believe that number. I think that, that's kind of too fast. So what actually happened? Pop count is what we call in Go a leaf function. Um, which means it has no, it doesn't call anything else. It is, the, it is the leaf on a call tree. And because of that, it makes it a really good candidate to be inlined. And by inlining it, now the compiler can see that bench pop count and pop count itself uh, have no side effects. They make no change to their arguments passed in, and they affect no global state. So effectively, it can be eliminated. You can't prove that I didn't do that work, so I'm not going to do it, because you can't prove it. And this is effectively what the compiler sees. Um, and uh, Intel CPUs are really good at optimizing empty loops. So that's effectively what we've timed, which is about, about one cycle to do, go around this loop doing nothing. And the, the reason I like this example is that the same optimizations that we want to make our code fast the dead code elimination, constant folding, uh, loop hoisting, all of these things which take regular, easy to read, bog standard code on the page and find the, find the inefficiencies and eliminate them are exactly the same optimizations that remove the extraneous bits of this benchmark and made it run ridiculously fast. So I put it to you that this is actually a feature, not a bug. Um, but Having said that, this benchmark is useless. So let's talk about how to fix it. Uh, so fundamentally, the problem is that this benchmark, and I'm sorry, I think that's a little bit cut off on that screen. This benchmark uh, has no observable behavior. We don't use its return value. So the first thing is probably to do something like this. So at least capture the result of pop count. Just as a show of hands, who thinks this is sufficient to make the compiler happy? Not one single hand. That's excellent, because this is not sufficient. Because R is still local to this call frame. It still is not global state. It, you, you can't prove that you ran it, because R ceases to exist when this function returns. So we need to put the result somewhere that the compiler cannot prove that somebody else can't see it. And the easiest place for that, the best way to fix your benchmarks, if you hit this situation, is something like this. We don't need to store into capital R result every time around the loop. Just doing it at the end is sufficient. But because this is a public package variable, there's no way for the compiler or any kind of code analysis to prove that there isn't another package in this program which is observing that variable. So we can no longer just eliminate this as dead code, because it's not. It's actually changing some global state. And just to prove that, we, we run it. Yeah, it takes about two nanoseconds, which is still pretty fast because it's a pretty decent implementation. But that's more what I would expect. That's eight, that's eight to 10 clocks, um, a lot of them overlapped. All right. Doing okay on time. So testing.b is useful for writing microbenchmarks. Microbenchmarks are useful for tuning the performance of like a single hot piece of code. Um, we use them a lot through the standard library because the standard library is which is the code which everything else is built on. So we want that to be efficient. But it's impractical and more importantly probably unreliable to construct a testing.b for like 
your main dot main. Like, like you can't, you can't reliably do a micro benchmark for your entire application. It just would just be too variable. So we should talk about other ways to profile whole programs rather than just little pieces of them. And in this section, we're going to uh, explore two profiling tools built into the Go runtime. The first tool we'll talk about is PProf. Has anybody used PProf here? Good, good, excellent. Um, PProf has been in Go since the year dot, since it, since it came out. Um, and it consists of two parts. Uh, a piece in the runtime, which is like the kind of runtime support, and a piece run outside, which is what we call Go tool PProf, which is for analyzing the results that the runtime bit produces. I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of profiling we have available. The most uh, commonly used one, and what one that people probably think of the most, is CPU profiling. When you turn on CPU profiling, the runtime itself will set up with the operating system uh, a timer interrupt, and every time that interrupt fires, it just writes down into, into the profile the stack trace of all the currently running Go routines. Uh, when the profile is complete, it's pretty straightforward to just count up the number of times a particular stack trace appears, and then therefore that, that stack trace that appears the most in the profile is the one that was using the most CPU. Memory profiling uh, records a stack trace whenever a heap allocation is made. So that is, it records the stack trace that led up to an allocation. In this model, stack allocations are basically assumed to be free, and they are not tracked in the memory profile. Now, memory profiling, kind of like CPU profiling, is sample-based. By default, we sample every one out of every thousand allocation when you turn this on. You can, if you like, reduce that, reduce that rate down to one out of every one allocation. And something that I put here as, as a note is that um, because it's sample-based and because it tracks the allocation, not the lifetime of, uh, of its use, memory profiling is not really Go's equivalent of like a heap dump. Um, it, it, I, I, we have many cases where people reach for memory profiling, they're like, I have some memory issue in my program, I don't know why it's using so much memory. Fortunately, the, the memory profile is not going to give you that information or not directly in the same way that a heap profile was, would. Um, just quickly, some other pro supported profiles. These are the more esoteric ones. Um, block profiling is similar to CPU profiling, but it records the amount of time a Go routine spends waiting to run, not running. So it can show you where a large number of Go routines could make progress, but were blocked for some resource, and they show you the resources they were blocked on. Resources like that could be sending and receiving on an unbuffered channel. So if the if you're trying to send and the receiver's not ready, you have to, you have to block. Uh, if the channel's full, or if you're receiving from an empty one, similar situation. And trying to lock something like a, a sync mutex, which is already locked by somebody else. Talking about mutexes, we have a profile specifically for recording the stack traces of the holders of contended mutexes. So you can find the uh, call path to a hot lock. Thread creation. Profile records the stack traces that resulted in the creation of a new OS thread. Um, it's pretty much common knowledge that Go multiplexes many Go routines onto a small number of threads, but there are instances where you need to, you need to either take or create a thread to do some long blocking operation, a syscall, some syscalls, CGO, things like that. And so if you have a problem where all of a sudden the number of threads in your application spikes, this is the profile for you. And really the takeaway is that on this slide, these are quite specialized tools. Um, you shouldn't reach for them straight away. You should start with CPU and memory usage. Speaking of that, um, profiling is not free. Um, it has a moderate um, but measurable impact on your program's performance. And especially when you do things like if you increase the, um, the memory profile sample rate, uh, it will basically grind your application to a halt. If you enable multiple profiles at a time, and this is kind of like a trap, a trap for new players, you say, I, I have a problem with my application, just give me all the data. Turn them all on, I want to have all the data, and I will figure it out. What you'll end up with is just a bunch of profiles that report the other profiles that were running. So the, the simple answer is don't turn on more than one at a time. So the runtime, the interface to 
turning on to working with profiles is inside the runtime pprof package. Um, it's quite low level, and for various historical reasons, the interfaces between the different kinds of profiles that I talked about are not uniform. Um, a few years ago, I got kind of frustrated with this, and I wrote, as any engineer would, a little wrapper that kind of solves this. Um, and th this makes it easier to profile your application. Um, it's as easy as just adding one line, either unconditionally at the top of main, or maybe you want to put it behind a flag or something like that, and then importing the package. Um, it also takes care of things like capturing control C, so the profile is written out cleanly if you quit your application. Uh, and also, the kind of API won't let you turn on more than one profile. You turn one off, the first one will be, you turn one on, the first one will be turned off. So as a demo, let's pick on everyone's favorite program, Godoc, and profile that. If you're a Vim user, everyone should be using Fadi Hassan's um, uh, Vim Go package. You get Go imports for free, you get uh, quit on, uh, compile and save for free, all that stuff. So now, now we've added a profile in Godoc, literally one line. We now have a version of Godoc which records a CPU profile anytime time we run it. Just make that done. So that's it. Now, Godoc is doing its standard HTTP thing. If we cancel it, uh, there's a little handle in, handler in there that catches and writes out the profile before it quits. And how do we look at a profile? How do we look at a profile? Fantastic, it's on the next slide. Now, we've talked about it, what it can measure. Let's look at the results we get. One of the really nice things that I've been waiting for for a long, long time in Go 1.9, you no longer need the binary and the profile. As long as you have the profile, that is all you need. This is going to make such a difference in, uh, in SRE and operations that you no longer need to have the matching binary to a profile that was produced by a program. If you're using 1.8 or earlier, unfortunately you need both. Just upgrade to 1.9, save yourself a lot of trouble. So, use GoTool pprof on the path to the profile. And let's find out what the top talkers are. What are the, what are the top things that Godoc was doing? Um, all I see is runtime stuff. So like some syscall, a bunch of stuff which seems to be about the garbage collector. Like there's no Godoc code in here. What is, what is going on? And when I talk to, uh, talk to programmers and try and talk about profiling, um, it seems quite nat natural for people to use this interface. But I find the, um, the graphical interface to be much easier to interpret. So this is the same profile, but as a graph. Now, I'll try and make it larger for the, the screen here. And, th and this is syscall.syscall. Yep, it absolutely is the top talker. But syscall doesn't call itself. It's being called from other stuff. So let's trace back up. Uh, LSTAT, there's some reading directories. OK, so now there's some stuff about reading directories and yeah, we're, we're still reading. Looks like we're walking through directories. Now, this, this gives you a little bit of clue about what Godoc is doing. And um, let's not forget that this is the Godoc. It's not running anymore. It doesn't matter. Um, th th this is the version of Godoc that you run on your laptop so you have your documentation. So the first thing it does when it starts up is walk through your Go path, read all the files, and you know, build, build tables and stuff. And this is exactly what we see here. All, all of the time in the first couple of seconds, so the first you know, nine or 10 seconds, is built, walking the directory and building, building this file tree. So we talked about. Uh, this, is the, this is the graphic. So what, what we saw in PeepOff kind of matches what we know it does. You can also uh, very easily, if you structure your uh, benchmarks as testing.b benchmarks, you can get profiling from them for free. Um, 
just pass CPU profile, MEM profile, block profile, all, all those ones. So in this example here, we're just running the tests for the bytes package and capturing a CPU profile on the way out. Um, the, the, the tip here is the CPU profile is going to run for the whole of that testing binary, but we don't really want to like actually get profiling data for the tests. We just want the benchmarks. So hopefully everyone knows that uh, run and bench are regexes. So XXX matches nothing in the bytes package, um, and dot matches all the benchmarks. So that basically says, don't run any of the tests, just run the benchmark functions that match this regex. So that, that's an easy way to get a CPU profile for some or all of the benchmarks in your, in your package. All right, we're we doing on time. Pretty good. Okay, the second profiling tool uh, I want to talk about is the execution tracer. This was added in Go 1.5 and remained underdocumented for a little bit until it's, there have been a lot of good presentations recently over the last year, 18 months. And unlike sample-based profiling, which we looked at before, because the execution tracer is integrated into the Go runtime, it doesn't just know what the program was doing, like any sample-based profiler can do that. It knows why. It gets nanosecond precision for Go routine creation, start, stop, why they started, what started them, what stopped them, um, blocking and blo unblocking events. Um, it's integrated into the network polar, so it knows when Go routines start and stop and interact with the network. Uh, syscalls, obviously, and a lot of detail about the garbage collector. There are a few, uh, few caveats when using uh, the trace tool. The visualization tool that we're going to see in the next slide uh, actually reuses a lot of mechanisms built into Chrome. Um, it's actually part of the Chrome Java, uh, JavaScript debugging stuff. So unfortunately, it's not going to work on Firefox, Safari, IE. Sorry about that. Um, my life was significantly improved using this tool when someone told me it supports WAS and D to, to move around. You do not need to use the mouse, and especially because it's JavaScript, there's no right, right mouse click support anyway. So WAS and D, super important to know. And question mark, just like all Google products, will give you the list of hotkeys. And the last one is that viewing traces can take a lot of memory. Like, seriously, four gig is not going to cut it. Um, eight gig is probably the minimum. And if you're analyzing some very large traces, because don't forget it's going to load all this crap into your browser via JavaScript, you, you need a lot of memory. That's one of the downsides at the moment. So let's do a demo. Let's pick on Godoc again. And instead of doing a CPU profile, we'll grab a, we'll grab a trace profile. So. And we'll just run Godoc, uh, you know, the, about the same amount of time. So we want to want to see what it looks like. We saw a, a pprof type profile. Let's have a look at an execution trace. Um, to at, now we have the trace. We use a slightly different tool. Go to trace and the profile. And because this is reusing kind of JavaScript uh, stuff built into Chrome, what's actually happening in the background is. This slide is running a little server to like spoon feed data into, into Chrome. So what we see here is that the trace has been split into two sections. Like there has, it's roughly uh, a limit on the number of events. So the larger, the longer your trace runs for, and the number, the more events that are in it, is really the, the size of the splitting. Let, let's pick this one. Actually, that's not very interesting at all. Uh, well, it is, but for not reasons that are worth going into now. Let's pick this. So we're going to be looking at the same visualization that we saw here, but rather than looking at it in terms of, in terms of call stacks, we're going to be looking at it as a function over time. So let's just kind of make this big enough. So from the top to the bottom, we have a list, a list of Go routines. Um, and so at this point, uh, this point in the execution, we had four running Go routines, which matches the 
four processes here. We had about 54 that were runnable, but hadn't been scheduled yet. So quickly at a glance, you can see how many goroutines are running in this program. Um, the heap is the next one, and it follows that traditional stair-step garbage collected pattern. Um, threads also uh, show you the number of operating system threads actually in use in your Go program. Interestingly, out in this area here, um, you can see it kind of like a, uh, sometimes the, depending on when I run it, sometimes the spike is much larger. Um, but th th this, is, this is a spike in running threads uh, that are not actually in the Go runtime, they're off actually doing thread stuff. Now, you could see highlighted here, this next row is talking about garbage collection stuff. That's when the garbage collector is actually running rather than being in the background. And the, the, these last four columns represent the four processes or the procs or the P's as you might think about them. And there's really two parts to this. There's the kind of top part, which is your code. And this is the bottom path, which is usually uh, runtime related stuff, garbage collector stuff, uh, perhaps even like a syscall or something like that. And we can just keep zooming in here. Like, that is five microseconds between that. You cannot get that resolution with sample-based profiling. And you can click on any one of, the, any one of these uh, little boxes which represent a goroutine running and stopping running and find out stuff about what it was doing. So for example, this, uh, this little piece of sweep here uh, was a bit of background work that the garbage collector asked the goroutine to do. The, Garbage collector is not, um, doesn't have this kind of finite off or on state. Um, the more allocations run ahead of the garbage collector, the more work the allocator has to do. And so we can see here, this started with something to do with building a directory tree. We're doing some strings.join in the runtime. And because that, went, because that touched the allocator, the, the garbage collector is in a mode where it says, well, you have to do a little bit of work for me before you can go back to doing your own work. And we can see all this level of detail. Uh, this, is, this is invaluable. So, so we, just looked at, we just looked at two ways um, of tracing kind of like a running program from start to finish. But this may not be, this is useful, but this may not be how you run your application. For example, you saw how much data was generated. Uh, you, could, you can imagine this would be infeasible to have this running in production from start, running for weeks until you do your next deploy. So it would be really useful if we had a way of just jumping in, turning it on for five, 10 seconds, grabbing a trace, leaving, turning it off. And this is exactly what the net HTTP PPROF package provides you. Um, this line here, how many people have seen, have seen or used this line in their code? Yeah, good, good. So when you import this, this is a somewhat questionable use of a side effect import, but it registers a few debugging um, handlers on the default serve marks. So basically just by importing this, you get a little kind of debugging endpoint in your application. So to show this and to give uh, another demonstration of the trace tool, uh, given I'm in San Francisco, um, I offer you Mandelbrot's as a microservice. So. Let's have a, before we run it, let's have a look at this program. So attribution definitely is well. This is Francis Campoy's uh, Mandelbrot package, which we collaborate on doing various demos with because it is a wonderful tool to demo with. We can see here we have the net HTTP prof. We're also going to register a handle func uh, on the Mandelbrot endpoint and then wrap that in something just to log the request, just so it's useful to see. Uh, the Mandelbrot endpoint itself, we make a 512 by 512 image. We create a weight group with uh, 512 entries in it, and so we spawn a go routine for each row in this Mandelbrot. We run them all together, and then when they're all done, we then write it out as a PNG. So, when we get a request, we're going to dedicate, we're just going to throw 512 go routines at this, at this problem, 
do it as quick as we can, send the result back. So now it's running. Yep. And when you, when you hit it, let's get this man abroad. The size 512, 512 was deliberately chosen because it takes a moderate amount of time on this laptop, about, about 200 milliseconds. So what we want to do is we want to trace this program while it's running. Now, because I would need three hands and two screens, rather than trying to like alt tab and stuff like that, I'm just going to run a kind of AB style HTTP tester. This was written by um, uh, Jana Berger Dogen. Uh, it's called Hey, and the reason I choose it is that it uh, supports this mode where you can say send one per second. Don't just send one at a time, but send one per second, like kind of QPS. So if we run that, see now it's just issuing requests. So now, great, now the application is doing some stuff. We can grab a trace um, and actually catch it doing stuff. How do we grab a trace? Just good old curl. Now, because we've said seconds equals five there, this is going to pause for five seconds. You can see that request endpoint there. Well, anyway, so now, now, so now we have a trace of a running application. Let's have a look at it. Um, it's obviously a bit smaller, so there's only one, uh, one trace there. It's not split over multiple ones. And when we look at it, we can kind of see that these, these kind of clusters of activity line up with what we expected. Like, like we're issuing one request per second. It takes about 200 milli, so... You know, one second, two second, three seconds, and these are probably in the range of what's that, 370 to yeah, that's about that's about what we expect. Um, I do have a version of this where I push the server into overload, and we kind of look at the behaviour of that. But this uh, is a really good way of analysing some of the results that we see. So, just before the request comes in, there are nothing, no go routines running. As, so as soon as the request comes in, we see it spike up to like. 460, 500, so that's obviously creating all those go routines. And then you can see the CPU getting very busy. We just go routines running the Mandelbrot function as it slowly chews through them all. And then the program moves into the second phase where it seems to be allocating more memory because the, uh, the heap is going up. And that corresponds with the, that corresponds very closely with the writing out of the PNG. And we can tell that because we can click on it we can see down here, handle function in Mandelbrot in code. So yeah, definitely this bit, which is allocating memory, is uh, running the PNG compressor. Now, one other thing, if I can just find it. I'm looking for, there it is. There it is. So I was looking for this. This is on the network line. This is the record of the packet coming in, the HTTP request coming in. And not only can we identify that, but we can say, what did you do afterwards? So if we click on unblock, it will create this little arrow here. Sorry for jumping around, but we can see here that this network request directly resulted in this go routine waking up. And this go routine is obviously the surf HTTP, surf HTTP, our Mandelbrot one. So then, as we go across here, all of these Go routines, their incoming flow is this Go statement. So you can trace the you can you can trace a request both in time and also how it interacts. So this is obviously our all these arrows here are all the Go statements firing off these Go routines. As we see, their their number starts to shoot up, and then that's just slowly processing them, working its way down. And if we go to the other end. We're now back in HTTP serve, and we can say, what unblocked you? What made you wake up? And what made it wake up was the wake group being done. So there's a tremendous amount of, tremendous amount of detail that I really have no more time to go into available in the trace tool. I think it is just amazing. Uh, here are a whole bunch of links. This will be online straight away, so um, you don't have to write them down now, um, of more talks about the execution trace. So it is uh, a wonderful tool. So with the time that I don't have left, I want to spend a little, I want to talk a little bit about 
memory management, and garbage collection. Um, Go is uh, unashamedly a garbage collected language. This is a design principle. Um, it's not something that's going to change at this point. Um, and because it's a garbage collected language, the performance of your program is often determined by your interaction with the garbage collector. Um, from the worldview of garbage collector designers and authors, their worldview is that they want to present to the programmer this illusion of an infinite amount of memory. They want to free you from having to think about freeing memory by, by promising you this world that you can allocate an infinite amount of memory. Because, they, because behind the scenes, when you lose track of that memory, they can clear it up and you can't prove that they did that. So you might disagree with this statement, but it's important to understand it from the, the way that this is how the garbage collector designers think about it. And more importantly, from Google's experience with uh, uh, running their production systems, as Carmen talked about this morning, the GC favors lower latency over maximum throughput. It really targets driving the, the latency figures down. And the results over the last four or five releases of Go have just been to drive that latency down, drive the, um, the pause outliers down into the, into the microseconds range. Because fundamentally, an application which has stopped, um, stopped because of a GPC pause is no different to an application that's crashed from the point of view of something trying to send it work. So if you can reduce the, if you can reduce the latency, you increase the, the total amount of capacity you have to process things. Now, I want to give you the super simple way to measure the activity of the garbage collector. And that is this GC trace equals one flag. This turns, these statistics are always being collected, but they're normally suppressed. So it, it costs you nothing to turn on this, this profiling. So again, we pick on Godoc. Oh, it's just another. We run it with this, this flag enabled. So now it's going to print out every time we do a garbage collection. And this matches what we expected before. We saw it does a lot of work reading, reading and building tables and things like that. And then enters this mode where it just quiets down and waits for requests. Um, and now, obviously, everyone's application is going to be different. But this is like, like the, when I arrive at a performance problem, I just turn on, turn on this flag and I get an instant thing like, is this program bound on allocations or is it bound on something else? If this is just spewing off the screen uh, without end, it's pretty, pretty clear they haven't got a handle on their allocations. Uh, okay, the garbage collector provides you exactly one variable to tune its operation, which is effectively the size of how much should the heap grow. Um, the default value is 100, which means it will double every time. It if it needs to grow, it will double. It will double itself. If you set that value higher than 100, it will grow larger every time it needs to, um, with with the view that hopefully this will reduce the number of times you have to grow. If you set that value smaller, uh, it will cause the garbage collector to uh, run more frequently. Maybe keep the heap uh, the heap under control and maybe use less memory. There's no real. I mean, 100 is the default, but really. It's up to you to profile and uh, choose the best value for your application. Um, I think I'll move to some conclusions. So I have a little bit of time for questions if that's possible. And I want to end with some concluding remarks, which is start with the simplest possible code. I measure. Profile your code to identify bottlenecks. Like maybe, maybe it's fine. Maybe there are no bottlenecks. But don't guess. Don't, don't say, right, I've written some code, now I, need to find, now I need to find all the performance problems with it. Um, so yeah, if the performance is good, stop. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to optimize everything. You should have both a upper response time and a lower response time. Like There's probably little value going below 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds to a web style request. Humans can't really see that, uh, see lower than that. And importantly, as your application grows, your traffic profile is going to evolve. People are going to use your application in different ways as new features are added, as new kind of social circumstances change that make them use it. So your performance hotspots are going to move. And when they do, don't leave that complex, hyper-optimized code there. This is an opportunity. This is no longer a need to spend complexity debt in this place. Rewrite it to something simpler. Um, and speaking about simple, 
try and always write the simplest code that you can. We saw in the example with the string concatenation, um, in contrary to perhaps what some of, you, some of you may have thought, and certainly I thought when I first did this example, um, it didn't turn out to be that bad. So write the simplest code you can. The Go compiler is optimized for, I said normal here mainly because I don't like the word idiomatic. I think that we kind of use that as a shibboleth. Shorter code uh, is faster code. Um, like fundamentally less, less Go code will, uh, less code on the page will optimize to a smaller program which will probably run faster. Um, Go isn't C++, it's not designed to unroll all those complex templated abstractions. Um, and yeah, finally, pay attention to allocations um, and try to, try to avoid them where necessary because allocations are really going to, in, in terms of their pressure on the garbage collector, going to determine probably the scalability of your application. And I want to I wanna close with two quotes. Um, the first one by Russ Cox is, I can make things very fast if they don't have to be correct. And Rob is always reliable. Readable means reliable. And I mention these because I've talked all about performance and nothing about any other aspects of coding in this talk. But performance and reliability are equally important. Um, I see little value in making a really fast server that is twitchy and unreliable and panics and deadlocks and out of memories on a regular basis. Like, I don't think anyone here is building F1 cars that have to race for, you know, 100 laps and it doesn't matter if you have to completely rebuild the engine. You're writing production software that has to be reliable over the long term. So please don't trade performance for reliability. Thank you very much. <laughs>